Chapter 3 When do we go on the adventure? Katie asked impatiently. Well, this is... This is it, Matt said, feeling a little embarrassed. Oh, Katie replied with a disappointed look. Suddenly, all of the club members began to feel as embarrassed as their leader. When they had planned the camp out, it had seemed like it would be a great adventure. But now, looking around at Tony's backyard with the swing set and the car in the driveway, it didn't seem adventurous at all. Matt's face brightened as he looked past the yard and into the woods. You know, when we first planned this camp out, we were going to camp along the lake, because it would be like Washington and his men camping alongside the Delaware River, Matt said, thinking out loud. That would have been great if our parents hadn't all said no, Q sighed. They said no to camping along the lake, but they didn't say no to taking a hike there, Matt pointed out. Well, I guess we can try and ask them tomorrow, Tony said as he watched the lights going off in his house. I wasn't thinking about tomorrow, Matt whispered. You weren't, Hooter whispered back, his mouth full of marshmallows. No, I was thinking about tonight. Tonight, Hooter, Q, and Tony all repeated at once. It's going to be kind of hard to ask them tonight, Tony motioned to the, his darkened house. Looks like my parents have gone to bed. I think we should wait and get their permission. What could be wrong with a little hike, Matt pleaded. Besides, it would be great for the club. We don't want to just read about adventures. We want to have them, too. Some of those rebel soldiers were only a few years older than we are. Once they crossed the river, they had to walk for nine miles, in the dark, in a snowstorm. And when they reached Trenton, they had to fight for their lives. Come on, Tony. Compared to that, a little walk along the lake is no big deal. I don't know, Tony hesitated. I don't want to get into trouble. Technically speaking, we aren't disobeying anyone, Q pointed out. Since none of our parents said anything about a hike, we don't know whether they would mind or not. Q rubbed his chin, just the way he had seen Sherlock Holmes do in a movie. Sherlock Holmes was Q's hero. What are they talking about, Katie whispered as she sat down next to Hooter. I'm not sure, Hooter whispered back, handing her a bag of marshmallows. But I think we're going somewhere. After a bit more discussion, it was decided that the club would extend their first adventure from the camp out to a hike. And not just any hike, but a night hike along the lake. To get there, all they had to do was follow the path through Tony's woods. They had all been on the path before, but never at night. Tony seemed the most hesitant. I don't know if this is such a hot idea, he said. Don't worry, Matt tried to assure him. Your parents have gone to sleep and they'll never have to know about it. He stood up. We'll leave the fire going for you, Katie. There are still some hot coals burning. You be a good girl and go to sleep in the tent. It's too dangerous for little kids out there. He pointed ominously in the direction of the woods. I'm not a little kid, Katie said indignantly. I want to go with the club. I want to go with you, Matteo. Look, Katie, you can have that whole bag of marshmallows all to yourself. You don't have to share them with anybody, Matt tried coaxing her. But Katie wouldn't budge. If you don't let me come, I'll go and tell Tony's mom to call mom and dad. I'm going to tell them that you went on a hike to the lake and you wouldn't take me, she countered. Matt let out a loud sigh. He knew what he was beat. Okay, but if you act up, even once, you're out of here. Understand? I don't think this is such a good idea, Q said, shaking his head at Katie, who scowled in his direction. What if she falls in the lake? Or what if she gets lost? Or what if... What if she tells Tony's parents where we are, Matt interrupted. You have a point there, Q conceded. Then it's settled. We're all going, so let's put out the fire, Matt said, kicking some dirt over the still glowing coals. Everyone stood up and did the same. Katie grinned and fired her squirt gun at Q. Hey, he yelled, for it was a direct hit on his glasses. You'd better save your ammunition, kid, Hooter told her. We might need it for later on. Everyone began to make jokes about Katie's vast array of weapons and how she would carry the club's arsenal in case of attack. It was easy to laugh and joke in the safety of Tony's yard, but as they entered the woods, they soon grew quiet. It sure is dark in here, Katie whispered. Chapter 4 I bet this place is crawling with snakes, Hooter said, shining his flashlight on an old log alongside the path. I don't care as much about snakes as spiders, Q grimaced. Just the thought of walking into a web gives me the creeps. 
He adjusted his glasses on his nose, as he always did when he was feeling uneasy. Snakes and spiders are nothing to worry about, Tony turned around to tell them. He had tried scouting ahead, but only had the courage to go a few feet before the group. Tony's right, Matt said, sounding as fearless as he could. There's nothing to be afraid of. Suddenly, the loud screech of a hawk echoed through the darkness, and all the members of the Adventure Club found themselves huddling together in the shadows of the pine trees. Katie shot her water gun in the direction of the hawk, and everyone listened as the strange and unfamiliar noises of the night filled the woods. The moonlight filtered through the trees, creating a sea of shadows that seemed to shift and sway in the breeze. The leaves rustled above their heads as they felt a sudden draft on their necks. They could smell the cold dampness of the lake in the air. Tony was the first to speak. I didn't say there was nothing to be afraid of, he whispered. I just meant that spiders and snakes are nothing compared to the legend of the lake. Now that's really creepy. Matt gripped Katie's hand tighter. What legend of the lake, he asked uneasily. Tony made his way back to the path, moving very slowly and turning around every now and then as he spoke. The rest of the club trailed behind him. The last time I went to visit my grandfather in the nursing home, he told me about the legend of Lake Lavart. Wait a minute, Matt interrupted him. Was he talking about this lake? This is Levi Lake. He must have had his lake snipped up. No, Tony continued. He was talking about this lake all right. He said that years and years ago it was called Lavart Lake, and that over time people began calling it Levi Lake. He was born here a long time ago, and he knows all that kind of stuff. So what's the big deal? Hooter asked. They changed the name of the lake. What's so creepy about that? What's so creepy is that there was something strange going on in the lake, like it was haunted or something, Tony whispered. Was there a ghost? Katie whispered back, her eyes growing big as she brandished her sword toward the shadows. Well, no. No one ever saw a ghost. The people would disappear, and it wasn't as if they just drowned because they never found their bodies, Tony continued. Did any of them ever come back, Matt asked with a shiver, for the breeze had suddenly picked up. Some of them did, Tony told them, but they seemed to disappear for a while, and when they did come back, they were never the same. They all had fantastic stories to tell, and they would sit by the lake for hours just staring, like they were crazy or something. And the really strange thing is that all these people, the ones that never came back and the ones that did, all of them had gone out on the lake in a rowboat. What's so strange about that? Q interrupted. It is a lake and lots of people go out on boats. Tony stopped on the path and shook his head. Grandpa said that none of the people had a boat. He knew because when his best friend Adam Hibbs disappeared, my grandpa had been with him. They'd been a little bit older than us and had been camping out along the lake. They were sleeping in their tent when Adam got up. He said that he was thirsty and was going to get his canteen that he had hung on a tree. My grandpa heard his footsteps outside the tent, and then he heard what sounded like someone getting into a boat. He waited, and when Adam didn't return, he got up and went out to look for him. And guess where he was? Where? Hooter whispered. He was out on the lake in a rowboat, a rowboat my grandpa had never seen before. Grandpa said that it was a three-quarter moon, and in all the light he could see Adam's face as he rowed to the middle of the lake. And he was smiling smiling like he'd never smiled before. My grandpa tried calling to him, but either he didn't hear him or he wouldn't listen, because he never looked back to the shore. Tony stopped to take a breath. Suddenly a raccoon screeched in the darkness, and everyone automatically drew closer together. Then what happened, Matt asked, trying to keep the nervousness out of his voice. A cloud must have drifted across the moon, because it suddenly got dark, and grandpa ran to the tent to get a lantern. But when he got back to the lake, it was too late. Adam Hibbs was gone, disappeared, boat and all, and no one to this day knows what happened to him. There were five more cases of people disappearing over the next fifty years, and Grandpa investigated all of them. He could never put to rest what had happened to his friend, and so when these other people disappeared, he was right there asking questions and looking for clues. The only thing that my grandfather ever uncovered was that there was always this rowboat, and the disappearances always happened under the same moon. Tony was speaking now in a hushed whisper. It was always a three-quarter moon.